Hello and welcome to another edition of the CPL Newsroom Podcast. My name is Christian Jack, as, as usual, joined by my newsroom team. On this episode, we will review the four matches this weekend in the Canadian Premier League and recap USA 1 Canada 0 from the Gold Cup in Kansas City on Sunday. That was a close game, unfortunately for Canada, just on the wrong end of it. But fortunately for Canada, they have qualified from the group and they have qualified in second place and will play in the quarterfinal next Sunday. Uh, opponent CBD. Uh, but name one player, boys, from Canada who impressed you against the United States, not named Tejon Buchanan. Charlie, I know you put him as your man of the match, and it has really been the Tejon show so mm-hmm. far. Uh, but other than Tejon, uh, Charlie, have you got a name for me that, who impressed you against uh, the US? US? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe leave some of the more obvious shots for you guys. I'll go with Kamal Miller. Kamal Miller. I think, I think like he was that. actually really quite good in that back three. I think he was very good as well. Brady? Yeah, I like Sam Piet. He's had a hard time getting into this team with with the way you stake and K have played, but I, I thought he was he was good in that deep midfield role. Benedict Rhodes, good morning. One player for you. I'll go for another person in the back three. I'll go for Alistair Johnston. Alistair Johnston and Marty Thompson. I'll go with Richie Lai for reasons that we will cover later in the show. There you go. Like, and I <laughs> and I will go with Liam Fraser. So we all got different ones. Yeah. Fair enough. Who I thought was absolutely excellent in the second half uh, in that game in midfield. All right, let's break this down. Uh, By the way, the results this week in the Canadian Premier League were Halifax Wanderers 1, Cavalry 2, Pacific FC 1, Forge 2, Valor 3, York United 0, Atletico Ottawa 1, FC Edmonton 1. Goals galore, and we deserve them after no goals much from open play at all in the four games in midweek. Lots of storylines. We'll get into those in a minute with our correspondents. We start, though, with the Gold Cup clash. Charlie, US one, Canada nil. You were our correspondent on this. I did mm-hmm. the game for uh, for one soccer as a broadcaster. Overall, I think everyone felt pretty good about the way Canada played, despite not getting any any points from the match. Yeah, yeah. I th- I think we probably all felt better about it actually than John Herdman did, because he. I was maybe surprised with how how disappointed he was after the game. With uh, I mean. You you never never ever expect to go down one nil after twenty seconds and yeah you know I think nightmare is is underselling it <laughs> to start a game like that in in front of a, a hostile crowd but like yeah eighty nine minutes of that game Canada are the better team right I, yeah. I don't think there's there's much question about it um, they they seem to to want to play quite direct I think they're maybe just trying to get the best out of out of the players that they had on the pitch which mostly meant getting the ball to Tejan Buchanan as much as possible. Um, he, uh, he played like three different positions in this game because he, I think he, he started at, at at the left of this this 3-4-3 and then he ended up on the right maybe after after a couple substitutions. And by the end of the match, he was playing as a number 10, right? And I, it was really, we saw a lot of different kind of shapes from Canada because again, they came in in that 3-4-3 and, and the way John Herdman explained it was they go down and then they lose Io Akinola around the 25 minute mark to, to injury. They bring Jonathan Osorio on and he said that they went into this more more of a three box three, he called it, with uh, with with uh, Buchanan and, and Richie Lai switching sides. They still had a lot of the ball. They pushed it forward. They kind of bypassed the midfield a good bit with these balls over the top uh, because I think the, the Americans had a little bit of a numerical superiority up there and they they really were just trying a whole lot of things and and i I don't know if they necessarily ended up with as many real high danger scoring chances as they might have liked to see but there's a lot of positives in the way that canada kind of took control of the game Uh, i mean a lot of a lot of the possession they had is is largely down to to sam piet and liam frazier just winning the ball and we lost brady there and establishing connect uh possession just very comfortably but i mean i i kind of did mention after the match in, in my analysis that maybe they were they're were actually missing you know what a eustachio or, or a mark anthony k or even even if jonathan osorio had maybe started this game he obviously came on but there was maybe that bit of a creative transitional link at the front of the midfield missing a little bit mm-hmm. uh because because piet and fraser aren't necessarily that kind of player but uh i mean to to kind of to kind of stop rambling here it's it's uh <laughs> It's a fairly positive, positive uh, performance from Canada, even though they're really, really disappointed with the the result because they felt like they they should have had more. 
Yeah, I can understand internally why they'd be disappointed, right? They want to win games, but I think, oh, you know, when we're in charge of reviewing matches and analyzing this, I think we said basically we can look at the performance over the result and say it'd be nice to win, but, you know, ultimately, I think the way that they played, there was a ton to take from it. I think margins at, the t- at that level are really fine. It's a, it's a bit of a lesson to say you've got to be on it right from the start, and they weren't, and Tejon kind of put his hand up and said that, didn't he, when he let the, yeah. the runner at Shaq Moore at the back post come, come over and score that goal. So... That was a, a disappointment for them, but they responded so well to it. I th- what I like about Canada and this team is that they've got players who can play multiple positions and they can make so mm-hmm. many different tactical adjustments on the fly, which is so important in the modern day game. You know, we talked about, you talked about there about Buchanan. Lai was playing different positions all the time. You know, Fraser can kind of jump, drop in in the back three a little bit. So can Piet and then move forward in midfield. You've got different looks. You know, even Cavallini was coming a little bit, maybe too deep, but he was coming a yeah. lot a deep, deep in that second half as well. So a lot to like about it. Marty, what was the thoughts in the bubble about Canada when you were keeping an eye on this game? Uh, people were were shouting around the uh, around the hotel when I was running. I think it was all the penalty shouts. Yeah, we haven't uh, brought that fair. up yet. <laughs> yeah, I think I think that was what that was riling up people the most. Uh, Anybody think it wa- wasn't a penalty? Anybody shout for no penalty? No. Everybody thinks a penalty. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted to check because honestly I, there were people I, I know my colleague Oliver Platt who was in Kansas City put his hand up on social media which is never easy to do and said he didn't think it was apparently so I see yeah. what he's saying but uh, I just I just think that's that's called more often than not yeah and and like, Richie Lai deserves to be man of the match for that <laughs> my man of the match anyway <laughs> 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 he just he just like for me I, I kinda broke it down the broadcast. Like if you like Zimmerman just falls over and like he's out of control and chops mm-hmm. his leg from underneath him while he's in the box. Forget it's what a rugby else tackle. it is. Forget what else is happening at the uh, you, you know, you could call it a rugby tackle, you can call it whatever. You know, like when you get you know like 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 when you hand the ball off to a running back and he makes a plant and he mm-hmm. goes through the defensive backs and he's like and he's coming towards like the, the end zone in the football and the guy just like takes his legs from underneath mm-hmm. him and he that, yeah. that that's that's what basically what it was. He just collapsed underneath his, his body. Uh, and, then, so, yeah. and then foul or not, he you know puts his hand right on the ball anyway. The ball. So, <laughs> yeah, I've heard that's yeah. illegal in this sport. You're not actually allowed to use your hands on the ball. Yeah, as yeah. much as we you know we've seen in the Canadian Premier League already. Um, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, Benedict, did you enjoy the game? Yeah, definitely. I thought, um, as you kind of alluded to, uh, Canada probably deserved maybe a little bit better in that game. Um, but overall, as, as you said, I think uh, on the broadcast, the, it was the best performance Canada's had this tournament and stuff is going to build on going to future games. And behind you, breaking news, the England flag is gone, replaced by a Canada flag, all <laughs> ready for the Olympics as you get ready to be up at all ridiculous uh, hours to cover the Canadian women's team, uh, for which we thank you for that. Um, Brady, is there something to be said about Canada? Everything's positive, uh, but internally, there's there's a reason why you think they're really disappointed here. I mean, they're competitors. You know, they want to win games. We're all saying, you know, a, a lot of positives here. But can you understand why you can see the players were dejected a little bit after the match? Yeah, I think it's just a sign of of where this rivalry has kind of grown to. This is not a you know they don't want to be happy to hang their hat on a on a good performance. They want a result every time they play this team and. You know, to have a start like that to be behind 20 seconds in, you, you do have to give credit to their response, but that's that's not what this group wants to do. They want to be on the front foot. They did that for the for the most part of this match, but I just think it, it is it's probably the best time this lesson could have came because the, the stakes weren't particularly high, but at the same time, it's it's something you certainly need to correct as you as you head into the knockout stage. Final word on it from you, then Charlie. I know you wrote about this, and John Herbman talked about it in his in his post match press conference about belief and installing belief and a sense of belonging and and knowing that you can compete against these teams and then maybe you can just share the story about what john shared with you guys in terms of how he got the images to these players and and showing what it's like to play against the united states and 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 competing against them at a high level yeah i i really love how much this canada team seems like they specifically want to beat the united states i think that's (laughs) i think that's really good uh you know for both sides yeah uh, so so basically, I mean, both coaches were, were asked about this after the match. And, you know, Greg Berhalter from the American side was very, very reserved and, and respectfully said, yeah, yeah, I think I think our teams have a lot of mutual respect. I think we're two programs in very similar positions based on the the sorts of academies our players have come from. Uh, and John Herdman was like, yeah, I uh, I really tried to make our guys hate this team. <laughs> I, I, it sounds like they, 
they kind of went into this game talking about this or the the propensity for this to be a rivalry. And it sounds like they just showed highlights of that October 2019 game at BMO Field where they got a taste of beating the U.S. And, and what Herdman said specifically was, we showed them pictures of the Americans' faces just so that they could see, you know, the doubt on these players after they'd come into the game expecting to beat Canada. Because 20, 30 years, the U.S. goes into a game against Canada, they expect to win every time. And to extend that's still true. And, you know, it still only not happened once in recent memory. Right. But I think we're just we're starting to see that doubt creep in. And, and, and Herbin kind of said that these guys have earned the right to cause doubt in a team like the United States. And I mean, I, again, we kind of will look at the game and be like, well, we, they, they nearly did, but uh, they didn't quite. And, and they are really, really going to be champing at the bit for another opportunity and possibly, possibly with higher stakes in the world cup qualifying. But yeah, it's, it's really, really special to see just how badly they want to beat the United States and just how, how uncomfortable the United States was playing against this Canada team. Yeah, it really was. Really good to watch. I'm glad everybody enjoyed it. And uh, as you said, this Gold Cup adventure will continue uh, next Sunday against one of Costa Rica or Jamaica at 7 o'clock Eastern, live on One Soccer January, on January, July 25th. And we will be back on Monday morning to review that and the final matches inside the Winnipeg bubble in the Canadian Premier League, uh, for which we move on to now. And we'll start with the late game on Sunday. It ended Atletico Ottawa 1 FC Edmonton won after our podcast on Thursday. Benedict, I got no end of the text messages saying of people spitting out their drinks with your joke at the end of the show. Uh, people expecting you to sell a game for fun and really pump the tires <laughs> in the game. And you went all in on the other way and you were like, no, nope, it's going to be boring. And you went with nil nil. Thankfully, one, you didn't get nil nil. And two, by reading your outstanding match report analysis on, on campio.ca, it appeared you stayed awake. For the entire game, how how was it? <laughs> I did stay awake, and I'm very glad to be proven wrong about the nil-nil. Uh, it was very end-to-end -end game, which I thought was, was pretty exciting, pretty exciting, pretty entertaining. Uh, overall, both teams were were decent. Both teams will probably feel or did feel disappointed. They only got one point uh, from that game, but uh, especially Mrs. Ottawa team. Was that the overall theme in the post-match press conference? I mean, I know Alan Koch's team got a late equalize in the 86th minute. How was Mista? Because this is a game where, obviously, coming in, they didn't play Drew Becky. Brandon John's done for the year, it appears like. And that's a real yeah. difficult news story to hear from him uh, as well. And they score early in this game. Zach Verhoeven got the great, great strike as well. And then they give away a goal like that near the end. I'm sure Mista was disappointed. Yeah, Mista was disappointed. Uh, Zach Verhoeven as well was was pretty disappointed. Sort of said like, if we're gonna concede a late goal, you got to score more goals earlier in the game. Um, obviously, didn't want to concede a late goal, of course, but uh, that's that's definitely kind of been a theme of, of Ottawa's season so far. Second game in a row, they've conceded a late goal and, and dropped points because of it. Um, and uh, they're they're sort of struggling to score goals at the minute. So uh, that's definitely two areas we keep saying that Ottawa needs to improve upon. And and uh, I think Sunday's game was kind of a good way of sort of capturing that. And you mentioned in your report, I think, did you give Dylan Powley my the match, I think, Benedict? I know you like him. He played really well again. And I think, you know, a, a little bit of moment there where he can he, he always has a bit of incentive against this team. Yeah, Alan Kosh said that too. He said uh, whenever he's, he plays Edmonton, he's motivated. And he's, he's picked up uh, four points against his former team in, in two games. And uh, yeah, he, definitely, he was definitely good on uh, on Sunday night. He had, I think, six saves. Um, but definitely, definitely the busier of the two goalies, Edmonton. Uh, had a lot more scoring chances in that game, and uh, Powley definitely, I think, showed up for the most part. And can't really fault him for, for uh, Edmonton's goal either. It was about ninety degrees or something ridiculous at kickoff, uh, but they didn't kick off until nine forty local time. And I know they play a lot of late games in Spain, and the Atletico Ottawa connection can certainly do that. But can't be many games, Marty, that these players have played on a, certainly on a Sunday night at nine forty p.m. local time. That's a long, a long day to wait for a game like that. Yeah, wrapping up the press conferences by about uh, what probably about twelve thirty local. 
Yeah, it was just a, a maybe a bizarre experience. Um, yeah, I mean, and and you, you touched on a bit of the heat there. Like the heat really is unforgiving out here, especially during the during during the evenings. It's also quite humid. Like it's almost like Ontario heat rather than than what we'd expect in the prairies. So right. yeah, I mean, and 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 uh, full credit to full credit to Edmonton in that regard because I know that they were you know they had a few more reinforcements than Ottawa, but I thought that they handled the second half really well considering all the conditions, considering that they had a fair few of their injuries themselves, but, and they still continued to push for that goal. Yeah. And the goal came by Kyle, Kyle, Kyle Porter from a little bit from a second phase of a set piece. Yeah. They also played Wachewski and Angaro together for the first time. Benedict, we alluded to that last week when they played him for the second half, chasing the game in midweek. What were your thoughts about these two who impressed more than the other? Do you think it's the kind of thing that they might go to regularly or they're just kind of, just kind of searching right now for a formula? Yeah, I think uh, as, as they sort of build more chemistry with one another, I think we'll see it more going forward, especially now that they've signed, uh, is it Duren, so you pronounce it? Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. Sort of another, another striker on the roster now. So uh, imagine when I see them play two strikers more often now that they have some sort of reinforcements on the bench in case something goes wrong for whatever reason. Perfect stuff. I thought uh, Wachowski was, was really good. I like Sorry. Wachowski. <laughs> I think Ungaro, Charlie's struggling a little bit to get going here in this, this season. Yeah, may, maybe a little bit. I think he's he's probably a little bit frustrated. But you know, Al, Alan Koch was asked after this game, you know, about this this two strikers thing, and and he was he wanted to to stress that it's not necessarily this traditional kind of you know two towering strikers that you kind of kick balls at their head sort of setup. Because I, I think he 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 explained he told some story about when he used to play in Germany um, that there are there are tall strikers that aren't necessarily you know the tallest when they actually play because he, he kind of explained both both Brzezinski and Nangaro are very good with their feet um mm-hmm. and they 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 like to have the ball played you know played low into them from from these wingers and and maybe maybe a Shamit Shom at a number 10 or something is just going to play the ball into their feet and they kind of play it off each other because they played quite close together Right. up front i think for a lot of this game even though they are quite athletic and they can cover a lot of ground so i think we're not necessarily going to see it, what you might expect from a team that just plays two enormous dudes up front <laughs> um, so i i think it might be a little bit of a longer process before it starts clicking it certainly wasn't like hunt punting the balls up to jesse zardas and daryl dk and just being exactly. <laughs> by the Canadian defense. <laughs> exactly that's not what we're going to see with this edmonton team exactly um marty any final words on these two before we move on uh i really like thomas gardner this game i think mm-hmm. he's, he's yes. really coming into his own uh u sports pick uh and and really again just a, a player that uh a player that he was, I think he's about 24, 25. He's a bit late for a U sports uh, draftee and obviously picked by Pacific a couple of times, but, but never made the team. Um, he just brings something else to this attack, right? How he was able to sort of uh, shimmy across and, and, and make space and get in behind, you know, that's obviously something that Sangaro and Worseski, you know, don't necessarily have in terms of that, uh, that kind of mobility and, and close control and be able to break lines like that. I just thought he was fantastic. He's something that, I mean, frankly, I've been be using more of. It's a good shout. There's a moment in the first half when he received the ball quite close to the bot penalty box and did a couple of moves. And he's 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 got that low body, low sense of control on the body where he really eases the ball and he's he almost he almost has the ball clued to his feet and he can move yeah. both ways. He's got a really good balance about him. He's got a little bit of Spanish quality about him, the technical ability that he moves in and out uh, of, of of possession and, and and getting around players. So I thought the way he kind of glided into the penalty box, it, he looks a really good player. I, yeah, I he kind of just like shifted his body to the. Side. I think I know which one you're talking about. Yeah, and they just like yeah, cut yeah. straight to the line. Yeah, it's great. Just, just get a moment out of nothing, and that's kind of what FC Edmonton still need, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they are last right now, the bottom, um, but they have only played six games, where most teams have played seven, five points from six games for FC Edmonton in eighth. As for Atletico Ottawa, only two points ahead of FC Edmonton, but fifth. So if Edmonton had somehow won that game, they would have moved up from eighth to fifth. That's how close it is near the bottom of the half of the Canadian Premier League standings. Uh, Valor three, York United nil valor continue to move on brady you're our correspondent on this what another performance this was and now they've won six out of seven games again jonathan siwa still hasn't conceded a goal a record of course that's gonna be very difficult to break for many many years by the way six clean sheets to start his career off in the canadian premier league and my first question to you is this 
was this their best performance so far? Because if it wasn't, it was certainly close. Yeah, I I would say yes. I think from from minute one to ninety, this was probably their most complete performance. Um, you know, like they get that relatively early goal on a, on a set play, give a York a bit of their own medicine, and then Reach provides that insurance marker right before the half, and then he's just his running and his energy was just it was causing fits for for York's back line all night, and that was probably a little bit about you know who who was the, in the personnel at, at the back for York. We'll, we'll probably get into that because they, they don't have a natural center back. It's a difficult situation, but. Yep. We can't take any credit away from Ricci for the two goals. They were both beautiful finishes, one on each foot. And then, honestly, York, they didn't really threaten, obviously, besides the, the penalty. And Lowell right had a decent strike from distance. But Valor just, they they have this ability right now to sit on leads that I'm not sure we're seeing from any other team to the same degree right now. They just, they look really comfortable when they get an early lead. And it just looks like it's going to be tough, tough to come back when, when you go down early against this team. It's a really, really good point. And, you know, I was doing the game for One Soccer. They are a direct team. And they are a, they, they are a team that are, they almost punch you in the face the way that they play. They just get the ball and they drive at you and they will find every weakness that you have and they will exploit it. And by the way, they don't just do it in the same style every week. I think, and I'm not sure, but I think, because everything's a little bit, I think this was the fifth different tactical look that we've seen from this team in seven games. Yeah, that probably. Is remo- that is remarkable. Yeah. Like, it mm-hmm. almost appeared like they started the game with a back three, and I know it was a fluid back three with Ray a push forward, and then Jean-Baptiste got his injury. They moved to a four. For me, it looked like a 4-2-2, two, 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 the, the way they wanted to play. Push the two strikers straight up on the center backs right away. Get the two players like Ray and Alan and between the lines, which was really important as well. Um, and, and of course, Owen just doing what he does, you know, mm-hmm. just picking up spaces and just stopping and intercepting balls and starting turnovers and, you know, quickly with his transitions. But Brady, this team is, they've got different looks. We're going to get to the big news in a second at the back line with their injury. But again, they, it, it, you know, and I know York have boys, but this did kind of look like men against boys tactically. Yeah, it, it was certainly very fluid. I asked Rob about, you know, the way that the midfield worked in, in the post-match. And I think I, I might have gave the wrong number when I cited his formation, which he kind of questioned, which which I thought was hilarious because I was supposed to be the expert and I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I can imagine York was having some difficulty with that as well. But yeah, I know he mentioned, you know, the you know, the opp- opportunity to give Daryl a night off from, from the start and asked Moses to go in and kind of do that job. And he offers something different. He was really he's, good, he's like by a, the he's way. He's a downhill yeah. runner. Yeah, he's he's like he's what I would describe as a downhill runner. It just seems like inevitable. He's always he always wants to press the needle forward. And then I thought Ailman looked really fresh. He he was given the night off on Thursday. He was he, I think he had the most passes in the opposition half in this game. He was constantly feeding balls into into Ray into Richie. And like you said, it's just like just like it just seemed inevitable that they were going to find some some gaps and spaces. And they were just constantly looking to push forward. And then once they get their reward, their two or three goals, it was come try and break us down. Yeah, and many of players again for Valor very possible could have made our seat our, our Gatorade team of the week this week. Some of them like Moses Dyer didn't, but I could have I would have loved to have got him. Jonathan Siwa did, Andy Baccaro did, who came on and was tremendous again. Uh mm-hmm. you know, Charlie's been on him from the start, but he was been excellent. Um, you know, and I, Austin Ricci did and Sean Ray did. Because I thought he was absolutely yeah. tremendous in between yeah. the lines with Rea, another young player. So you got Rea and Siwa from CF Montreal on loan. Uh, two big moments in the first half were Andrew John Baptiste going down. This could be really crucial. I mean, right now they're flying. But Marty, let me just turn to you. You know, this you couldn't you could easily make the case that this is not just the best defender in the league. That this has been the best player in the league so far this season through seven games. It, we're not going to speculate. The news might come out as you listen to this, but it did not look good as he continues to get more scans and more evaluation on Monday. Yeah, we're expecting some kind of update, at least here on the ground, uh, hopefully today. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the reaction on the Valor camp right after that happened and, and right after the game was, you know, if there's one player on this team to lose, you don't want to lose, it's him. And, and, and it happened. Mm-hmm. And I mean, thankfully for Valor, and I know this really doesn't come as a, as much of a consolation for their team at this point, they have defensive reinforcements, something Gail mentioned too. And, and something that we're expecting is that we're expecting another signing, another center back to come in too. So they have those players at the back, unlike York, as we saw. Um, so, I mean, it's, 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 it's brutal news and obviously it's brutal for the team, but at the same time, you know, for Valor and for Rob Gale's perspective, you know, they still have options back there, thankfully. 
Yeah, they do. We'll keep an eye on that. The other big moment came with a somewhat questionable penalty. Uh, maybe we could have had this ref refereeing in the Gold Cup. That would have been a little, <laughs> little bit easier. Uh, but he hands the penalty to York, and uh, then we he, we saw Oz Ramirez step up. But Jonathan Siwa, if you didn't see it, please go check it out. Maybe Marty can just add it in the video if you're watching it here. Has this absolutely enormous grin on his face. He is laughing. He's smiling. He's having the time of his life, Brady. And then he guesses right. Now, probably was inches off his line. And if you want to be a stickler, probably could have asked for a retake. But who cares about that? That just ruins a great story right now. We're here all in stories. Uh, Brady, again, guesses right, keeps the penalty out, and, you know, sustains the lead for them, maintains the lead for them, and gets another clean sheet. What's a story this young man's becoming in the Canadian Premier League? Brady. Yeah, he's easily been one of the one of the stories of the of the early goings here. Like, and I, I love that moment. Like you said, the the big grin and the big smile. He might have, you know, it would have been cheeky and cheated a few inches off his line. But it's awesome to see him show a little bit of character because we haven't seen a lot from from this guy. We don't know a lot about him, and and he's been one of the major storylines, like we said. And so there's a little bit of shades of Emmy Martinez from the Copa America that we just seen a couple of weeks ago. I love to see that. I love those. I love those mind games. Yeah, shout out Villa. Shout out Villa. <laughs> Ollie Bassett will love that as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's a <Carry> on. <laughs> It's distracting. It's fine. No, uh, yeah, sorry. no. I... Uh, we're talking about Emmy Martinez. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It was it was a natural segue. A natural segue. Maybe the weird yeah, shade. The weird weekly, shades. Our weekly villa segment. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> go, go ahead, and, Brady. Yeah, it's hard, Brady. All right, we'll back. We'll back to you. maybe KJ. You could you could stand in goal next did, time and just just hold the sign. Maybe up. I will. Did did Jonathan? I don't think he did though, because I was on one soccer. Jonathan didn't speak after the game, did he not? No. Brady? No. no. Okay. But no. I want to get. No. We need to ask him about no, Emmy sterile. Martinez. Maybe he's a, maybe he's a Villa fan too, Charlie. That maybe yeah. we can get Jonathan mm -hmm. Seawire on the Villa train with us. We need to get like a like a a group chat going with all of the all of the Villa guys in the CPL with you know Ollie Bassett and yeah. apparently Jonathan Sirwa. Let's get it. Let's get it going. Any 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 other Villa fans out there listening to this in the bubble, Marty, you can maybe you can ask around. Uh, we're all in. Get the Villa. We'll we'll do a Villa podcast one day, and we'll only invite Villa fans. Uh, yeah. So that would be uh, that would be good. Sorry, boys, Marty. You, I don't, I'm sure you're not a Villa fan, Ben. I know you're not, and uh, Brady, you just not get invited. Charlie and I'll have a fun. Uh, but anyway, away from the segue of Villa, although we could talk about the uh, uh, many, many. Could we? Many, yeah, we could very, very much. So. Absolutely, we could. Well, Charlie and I Absolutely. Could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bondia looks great, by the way, in his training kit. Um, what about York, uh, Brady? Let me turn to you again on this. What was Jim Brennan's take after the game? Because, you know, it, it, it is easy to say that they are massively missing Zator, particularly Thompson as well. But, you know, they have not got anybody that they need back there. But they're starting to look quite fatigued. And on moments like that last night, they look really young. And we praise them a lot. But occasionally it's going to, you know, we, we, we said, I think a couple of episodes ago, you got to allow these young players to fail and come through it. And they're going to build character for it. But on that night, Valor just looked far, far superior in all assets. Yeah, no, listen, Jim, Jim mentioned the other day how much they're missing Dom and those guys, despite how well those those makeshift center backs have done. But you'd always question the sustainability of something like that. It's it's a really difficult job to do. Like, it's one thing to, you know, be one on one and, and mark a player that's kind of instinctive in every soccer player. But when you're talking about, you know, making decisions like, do I step here and try to play a guy offside? Do I follow? Do I provide cover? Jordan, Jordan Wilson alluded to the this after the game that he struggled a little bit with that at moments, particularly on the yeah, second yeah. goal. Yeah. On the second goal, he just said, listen, I, tr I tried to step and it was the wrong decision in the moment. But when you're, when you're not a natural center back and you don't have game reps, it's, it's a really difficult thing to learn to do on the fly. And I think guys like Zator, guys like Thompson will improve this team before they even touch a ball, just, just with their vocal, their leadership and, and, you know, and, and their ability to organize things. But yeah, Jim, like after the game, Jim was happy with their effort. He thought, you know, they, they created enough chances for this to not be a three nil. And anytime you get a penalty, of course you hope to convert it. It's, it's unfortunate, but yeah, they both, both him and Wilson alluded to it. It's, it's been grueling. They're, they're just, they're honestly, they, they have another game left and they're, they're going to, they're professionals. They're, they're just still focused yeah. on that, but they are looking forward to getting back to York. So that, that's, that's kind of the, uh, the mindset right now. 
Yeah, the come on match of the week this weekend is their next game, I believe, uh, for York. They play Edmonton in their final match on Saturday. So at least they get a big a big midweek break uh, a mm-hmm. little bit. They can kind of recover and maybe get Petrasso back and Zator, even though, you know, we'll see. We'll, we'll keep an eye on that. Uh, but Valor continue to march forward at the top of the table. Six wins from seven, 18 points. And they are leaders in the Canadian Premier League. Uh, Pacific one, Forge two. This was probably the marquee matchup of the weekend. And again, the reigning champs come out in, on top in this one. Uh, Benedict, you were all over this as our correspondent. Becker with a brilliant winner. And by the way, there's been a storyline developing inside the Winnipeg bubble where every week I think we've got a contender for goal of the week and then goal of the year maybe as well. Uh, but it's some absolute brilliant goals. Your overall observations on this, again, Forge flexing their muscles, tactically different look again that we saw midweek with the back three and just proved a little bit too much for Pacific here, Ben. Yeah, you mentioned the formation change. I think it was uh, effective again for Forge, um, Pacific have a lot of troubles against Ford apparently and that's uh Forge one I think seven of eight now I guess against Pacific with the other one being a draw. So uh yeah Pacific have a lot of troubles a lot of troubles against Forge and and uh Kyle Becker's brilliant goal from, from long range was the difference. Marty Pacific have uh, been one of the the storylines so far. I know you loved them at the start. I think you actually picked them did you not to win it all. They you may well be proven right. But if they're gonna win it all this is a hurdle they have to get over, and they've not got over yet. Well, and and just to touch on it, the Island game specifically last year, right? There was the late winner from Kyle Becker. I think that was in the 97th minute in the first round. And in the second round, Forge dominated uh, uh, Pacific using uh, a dominated Pacific uh, and, and, and really shut down uh, Bustos and Chung. And to follow that up with this game where, you know, I was lucky, fortunate enough to be on the ground. And I can tell you, point blank, Pacific were frustrated by this game. They were frustrated from from even before the penalty given uh, given that was converted by Paulo Sabak. Forge is a frustrating team to play against, and they're a frustrating team to lose to because, you know, for, for obvious reasons. And I think that's maybe the issue for Papa Duka is, yeah, of course, there were some refereeing decisions that both teams, frankly, walked away disagreeing with, and we can touch on those or, or not. But at the end of the day, Pacific, you know, they, they, they were frustrated from minute one. I, I, I think, I think that's, that's fair to say from being there. And that's maybe not, that's maybe exactly what Bobby Smirniotos would want uh, playing a team, frankly. But, but did they have a right to be frustrated, Marty? Like, yes, that, okay. I think they did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think they did for a couple of reasons. Obviously, the, the handball with uh, in the box um, from Jordan Haynes, uh, you know, the, the, we can only get a couple different angles of it. Um, I'm not sure if you all think that's a penalty or not. I think, I think just how he maybe moved his shoulder down, it's hard to tell. Second they, time, by the way, against Forge already. Yes, that's mm-hmm. right. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, that that's a difficult one. And then, I mean, the game was also quite cagey. Uh, there were tackles flying everywhere. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I just think Pacific, you know, they had, they had a, maybe a right to be frustrated, but a team against Forge, like, again, we've seen, we've seen teams like Cavalry, right. Earlier in this, in this season, play Forge and, and, and get lost in it a little bit. Right. And, and get, and get frustrated. So that's, that's maybe going to be the issue for Palm and Duca moving forward. Charlie, is that their MO Forge? I mean, I know that they are probably the best yeah. team still, uh, but they, uh, a lot of teams annoy people when they, when they're yeah. like that, they've just got characteristics to do it sometimes. And that can be a real strength too. If you're not, if you, if you can't come, you know, rise above it sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Certainly Forge does seem to have a knack for, for getting the other team to just be really frustrated and kind of lose focus. I mean, whenever, whenever a team like Pacific did in this game comes out with five yellow cards, plus mm-hmm. several probably to their own bench, uh, yeah. you know that they've been a little frustrated. I mean, I don't really know what happened with some of them. I certainly don't know why it looked like Abdu Samaki was sent off and then not. Um, yeah, we but, believe on the ground that was supposed to be a second yellow. He thought he was on a yellow and then it, it came back. So yeah, but, I, yeah. Again, it was still a straight red. I don't know. Yeah, it was. I don't know. Yeah. And part of, it all kind of fed into into you know the frustration that they had after the game. But uh, I just wanted to wanted to add. I mean. Forge comes into this game with the back three, with their their wing backs fairly high, especially Kwame Wu on that left side, and it seemed like quite a good recipe for shutting down Pacific. I think mm-hmm. when when you know that Pacific's greatest strength is that right side with Chung and Bustos, mm-hmm. if you have an extra man in the back line and you're able to maybe free up a Kwame Wu, then you really really are able to shut them down. 
I mean, Marco Bustos, what we, we know that he's, he's a, a winger who is almost always going to cut in, right? Yeah. When he's got the ball, he played eight crosses in this game. And that's, uh, that's not really normal for him. <laughs> I, I don't know how many times we've actually seen Marco Bustos trying to throw crosses in. Cause I mean, he's not particularly comfortable with doing that with his right foot. Mm-hmm. So I, I really think that maybe that is, is something that, that Pacific will have to work on mitigating is when, when the opposition team can put an extra player on that side and, and maybe just take away a little bit more of that space because I think it has really frustrated them in this game. Yeah, it's a, re- a really good point. Uh, Dominic Samuel didn't make the Gatorade team of the week, but he was close and he mm-hmm. was very good again in, yeah. in, in that game. Awua did make it because he was absolutely outstanding. What a absolutely week. Absolutely well deserved. And, yeah, dominant forged week, by the way. A lot of players in the in the team of the week we'll get to in a second. But this shape that you alluded to, I know that they've kind of they haven't stumbled upon it because that would that would be taking the credit away from Bobby Sminiotis. They've certainly meticulously planned this shape. Mm-hmm. Um finding the best out of the, the, the available players. But it, there is something to be said that it works. You know, I, I you know, Ashinori Janssen falls deeper anyway, traditionally a lot. As you mentioned, you get Awua higher. I love Becker and Zise, who both make the Gatorade Team of the Week this week as a double pivot. They work really well together. And then Sabak, you get the best out of him as a false nine. He scored again in this game with a penalty. Uh, Benedict, turn to you again. It, there seems like an overall acceptance from Forge that things are starting to really turn up here what was your thoughts when you spoke to Bobby and the player after the match yeah Bobby after the game sort of said the same things you just did like they want Powell also back closer to the goal I think is what Bobby said and and uh he said when, he, when he's closer to the goal magic happens and obviously his goal was from a penalty but he did create a lot of chances he had the, the brilliant play to almost score if not for a save from Cal and Irving which probably denied us for yeah. another goal of the year candidate um <laughs> and uh Janssen as well I think was very close to being the man of the match um that was just the way he, if, if Becker hadn't scored that goal, it probably would have been Janssen. The way he, he dropped back into the back three, but didn't look out of position at all. And he, he's cr- uh, very slowly, or maybe not slowly, becoming a crucial part of that team. And probably the first name on the team sheet, I think, for Bobby Smirniotis at the moment. Yeah, massive fan of his. I'll be pumping his tires with Ashley Janssen for a long time. Uh, he made the team of the week this week, as did Kwame Awua, Kyle Becker, Ilamani Sise, and Paolo Sabag. Count them five. That's right, five <laughs> Forge players. But when you play the way that they played this week, you can't really argue with it, right? They're the best team. Uh, and I guess that leads us to the last question. If you're still picking a champion out of these teams, who would you rather? I mean, Marty, are you still going with Pacific here? Or do you look at that and think... That's going to be a test that Forge need to kind of overcome here. Uh, uh, sorry, Pacific have to overcome. Or, you know, is it, is the signs you think from this Pacific team that they could still do it? It's a good question. Between Pacific and Forge, I think that uh, I'm gonna stick with Pacific. I think this is something that I mean, it, it's it's a big hurdle, but this team's already shown quite a bit of quality. Um, maybe it'll be nice not to have to play Forge as often for the rest of the season once they leave the bubble. Um, and, and maybe get their mind off it. I still think I still rate this team quite highly. You know, Marco Busto still, you know, had had an OK game, all things considered. You know, there, there were still some quality chances there. I mean, it is what it is. I think I, th- I, th- I think I think that they have the the ability to overcome something like this for sure. Here's the thing about Pacific, and if you're Palmer Ducar and you're planning to play them in the playoff game later or, or in the game later on, you would say this. Look, we lost both games. But that first game was 3-0. It was never a 3-0 game. They were yeah. absolutely in it. Diaz blazed over the bar in a glorious chance at 0-0 when Forge were a champion on the ropes. They'd lost both yeah. games. And then they got three goals in 10 minutes and came out fighting. And in this one, they grew into the game. Hurd scored. And at that point, you're thinking, they could get back in this. You know, yeah, They were 100%. definitely in it. You know, Bassett took a bit of a knock. He got taken off. That kind of lost a bit of spark in the Pacific attack. But um, you, they're still in this. And I, I think, Charlie, that would probably be the message, would it not be right now to say – Okay, we don't have to play them for a while now, and there's still a lot of ton, a ton of things to like about this Pacific team coming out of the bubble. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. This Pacific team has, you know, shown at times some of the most attractive football in the league, and I think, I think with some of these some of these times they've lost, especially to Forge, they're fairly easy to to maybe break down and see, you know, where it went wrong, and and you, I think these are good games to learn from because you know it, it is still quite a young team, a team that's. That's building, and I think they will look at this game and be like, okay, well, 
Busta, Marco Bustas was involved a lot, but he maybe wasn't able to to do what he likes to do. We can look at why not, and I think maybe there's little tactical tweaks you can make. I think there's I don't know little little rotational things you can do with your squad, and I think I think it, it's it's going to be fairly straightforward for them to break this game down and and not be particularly unhappy with it because I think I think they you know again as as you guys said they really were able to get back into it with that goal they didn't get down on themselves they're certainly not certainly not afraid to get to play from behind against the defending champions of the league mm. and yeah i i think pacific's going to be fine guys <laughs> brady and ben quickly who would you who would you rather have right now if you're back in a team to win it all brady yeah it's it's tough it's tough to not like what pacific are doing especially when you haven't seen TNG and Baldismo in there with with regularity. I know everybody's dealing with injuries, but that's got to be something's cost considering. And I think if they can get that left side going, I liked Herd's energy off the bench yesterday. I know they tried Bassett a little bit from an inverted position. I don't think they know yet what their best eleven is. And once they figure that out and, and get a good run of matches, I think that they're they're still in the running for sure. Benedict, yeah, we're a fan of storylines on this show, and I think the, the storyline is set for Pacific to get over that hurdle against Forge. Maybe in the playoffs. So I'll, I'll back Pacific, I think, out of these two. There you go. Story I would still fun. back Forge, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> For the record. I will also add, we did not mention, Forge still have not seen the best of Tristan Borges. Yeah, absolutely. Just, that's uh, By the way, for all the compliments we're playing with Forge, who might be their best player, has nowhere near shown what he can do yet. So that's to come as well. Uh, but yeah, we'll keep an eye on that. I let, you know, we're all in rivalries here. And if they can have more rivalries going on as well, we'll get we'll get to that. Talking of teams who don't tend to like Forge, uh, Cavalry <laughs> certainly don't like Forge. And they uh, certainly needed a victory. And they got one as they beat Halifax Wanderers by two goals to one. A much needed win for Tommy Wielden Jr.'s team and a much needed attack that got some goals after not scoring in four straight games coming in. Although I think some of the performances were certainly better than that showing, but they needed to create, they needed to convert. They did with Anthony Novak and Ali Musa getting the goals. And we had a Joe Mason sighting, came on for 10 minutes at the end. So all things uh, all things encompass, encompassing, Cavalry had a really good day. Halifax has for them some concerns, and you could kind of feel that in the press conference afterwards. Charlie, overall, your observations from this one, from the highs of Cavalry to the lows of Halifax. Yeah, I think what we saw in this game was Cavalry playing like Cavalry a little bit more. And the cavalry that we've we've come to know. They played, you know, kind of similar to Forge in a 3-4-3 in this game. It was a little bit more traditional, though. They didn't have a false nine. They just had Anthony Novak as a, an out-and-out, out, you know, run at the center back, kind of number nine. And it really, really worked. They put Halifax under a lot of pressure with their their pressing. I think I think Ali Musi and, and Ahinga Selimani as as the wingers alongside of Anthony Novak really just just ran at the center backs all night long. And it really caused Halifax a lot of problems because pretty much every time they tried to play out of the back, which, uh, you know, surprisingly, they did probably too much. Uh, they would have to turn around and pass it back to, to Christian Oxner or they would be forced into taking a risk, which, you know, Cavalry loves to force teams to do because they can punish them quite easily. And I think that's kind of I think it was the first goal, the Anthony Novak goal that came from that. Uh, they 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 won the ball around the the halfway line and it's just route one they play the play the passes up and i think selamani makes that really nice little touch into the path of anthony novak for you know just just a more classic anthony novak finish and maybe at this point it's maybe at this point of the season it's more of a classic austin ricci finish but <laughs> <laughs> it was it was something that we've seen novak do several times and i i think really cavalry was very pleased with this comprehensive game they were able to shift things around a little bit they once they're they're leading in this game they bring daniel kaiser on and they're able to shift into more of a, a 4-4-2 to just kind of maybe maybe take a breath for a little bit and then you know they bring on richard luca and joe mason with 10 minutes to go and that's terrifying <laughs> like, yep. if i'm halifax and i'm chasing a game and i see the team across from me bring on those two guys who are probably two among the most dynamic and, and talented players in attack in this league right now, or certainly certainly based on pedigree alone, you're, you're a little concerned. And I kind of asked Tommy Wielden Jr. about this after the game. You know, you're you're up 
a couple of goals. Like what, what is the thinking here in, in bringing on, you know, out and out attacking players? And he says, well, yeah, the best way to defend is to just keep attacking. Right. Right. Yep. And that's kind of what they did because Halifax had their moments. They had some honestly parts where they looked more like themselves as well, which was actually when cavalry had more of the ball kind of when Halifax hit them on a counter a few times. And I think that's how they scored their goal, but really cavalry didn't, didn't bunker. They didn't sit back. They really wanted a third goal, I think in this game. And they just, they just did not stop. Marty, let me turn to you on cavalry. It appeared coming in that obviously their record of only having eight points from six games, six goals from six games, wasn't wasn't going to stay that way. When you watch enough games and when you cover the sport, you always feel like that the team has put enough good performances that eventually the outcome will match the process. And the, and that's I've always felt that coming in. I can't remember who predicted this game, by the way, campl.ca slash predictor on our last podcast, but I think didn't someone they whoever predicted it, I think they picked Cavalry 2 1. I might be wrong. But anyway, um, it felt coming in that Cavalry was a game that they should they should win. We'll get to Halifax in a second. They but they had to win and they delivered. And that says a lot about where the Tommy Wilden Jr.'s got this mentality of this team right now. Well, it's all it kind of comes down to how they lined up this team, right? Just like Ali Musi, Anthony Novak, Ahinga Suleimani as a front three. And they were just going like crazy to try to score a goal. That must have been what Tommy Wielden said. Like, we just need to break the duck here. Musi was really good, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Al, uh, shout out to Nathan Mavilla, a former Cavalry player. He tweeted out during the last game, uh, called him Ali Messi, which has really <laughs> stuck with me. Um, yeah, I, I I really like Ali Musi. Was it a typo think... or did he mean it? <laughs> no, he, he meant it. He meant okay. it. Uh, yeah. That's a good, yeah, it could have been, could have been a typo. Um, no, I, I, I really liked him at Valor. He didn't get a real fair shout there. He's kind of been played almost as a wing back at the time. And he's obviously quite familiar with, with, with Tommy. Uh, great left foot. Uh, obviously got a pretty hefty deflection on that goal, but still it was, it was well-deserved. Ali Moosey got the man of the match for Charlie and made our Gatorade team of the week as well for Calvary. So every credit for him. Has, as for Halifax... Uh, before I get everyone's take on it, Charlie, let me go back to you as our correspondent. It feels mm-hmm. like after the game, this was no longer painting a rosy picture despite the result not going their way. There's a bit of frustration kicking in here, no? Yeah, there definitely was. I mean, again, you look at the at the stat sheet, you know, 14 shots. Generally, that should put you in more dangerous positions than maybe we actually saw. Right. Uh, and I think that it's a similar story to what we've seen in other games, but, you know, the longer it goes on, the more of a concern it is. You know, Stefan Karajovanovic looks really good at times with the ball. He's got chances for whatever reason, you know, the, the soccer gods hate him or, or something. The ball's not going in the net. Mm-hmm. Um, and Akeem Garcia is starting to become, I think, a bit of a concern because we know how talented he is and how good he was last year. And he really just hasn't been able to, to get involved as much as you know they would like him to and Mizut Mert you know the the Wanderers assistant coach after the game was really frustrated with that he called the he called the result deflating uh which you know is is never never a rosy picture from a coach <laughs> um, right but he the way he kind of described it he's like yeah, you know you'll tell you'll tell Akeem Garcia for example you know the goals aren't going in and it's easy to get down on yourself for that but you really have to find other ways to you know get yourself your touches get yourself into the game just make an impact somehow whether it's you know drifting wider and letting somebody else take on that load or or just taking taking a touch and and you know playing it off for a winger or something you just need to kind of look for new ideas to maybe just get something going your way and i think it's really really i i think i think akeem garcia's start to this season may be I, I, I wonder if it's maybe the most disappointing start for a player to start this season because we know how talented he is. That's and I think he would probably agree. Yeah. Yeah. He would probably agree with that as well because, I mean, he was, he was you know, a candidate for player of the year last year. And and it's just, it hasn't hasn't worked out so far. It's not to say it won't. And I'm, I'd be quite shocked if he didn't start turning it around, especially especially when they get back to Halifax. But yeah, this is this Halifax team might be the unhappiest in the league at the moment. 
CPL low to three goals on the season for Halifax through six games. They are seventh in the standings on five points. They have two games this week to come. Uh, one on Wednesday night against FC Edmonton. One on Saturday night against High... Sorry, Saturday afternoon uh, against High Flying Valor. Um, final question on Halifax. Ben, Brady, I'll turn to you guys. Of the bottom four, and we know the top four, Valor, Forge, Pacific, and Cavalry are really, truly turning into being a big four in the chase for the four. Of the bottom four, Ottawa, York, Halifax, and Edmonton, do you still have more faith in Halifax than the other three to maybe make a run and become a team that can still win it all? Um, if so, why, Brady? I think, yes. I think they still have the highest ceiling of, of that bottom four. And I think... Uh, the advanced numbers would kind of support that, but we are getting into an area where the sample size is getting big enough that it's hard to, it's hard to stick at it without any results. Right. And I think that's part of that frustration. It's easy to say, Oh, it's, it's a long season. It's a long season, but we're almost a quarter of the way through now. And it's, it's, it needs to turn around quickly if they want to do that. But I would say I'm still highest on Halifax amongst that bottom four. Yeah. And you guys have covered a lot of them. That's why I lean on you guys. Often correspondents, you get different games. Benedict, you've done Halifax games as well. How do you feel about them? Yeah, I'd agree with what Brady said. I think they do have the high ceiling of those bottom four. And I think if they start to get some of these chances and, and finish them, I think it might be a different story that starts this week against Edmonton. I think it's, it's probably a good chance for them to sort of break the duck a little bit and, and maybe score a couple of goals and, and pick up a result. And uh, hopefully for them, the floodgates sort of open a little bit. Thank you, Benedict. That's what's just, called a segue in our show. So go ahead, Charlie. No longer if a I segue. Add, just add quickly on Halifax. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, they have the third highest non-penalty expected goals in the league right now. Yeah. And they obviously, as, as you said, just haven't scored goals. I mean, it's it's unlike last year where they were near the bottom of the league in expected goals and scored a whole ton. So that's uh, you know, it's a harsh cycle, but maybe an indicator an indicator that they are you know a lot better than their record suggests. Yes, no doubt. Edmonton play Halifax on Wednesday. The midweek game is just three this week. We'll be back on Friday to recap the ball on the show. Edmonton, Halifax, Wednesday at seven. Marty, give me a prediction. Can they turn it around, Halifax? Your thoughts? 3-3. Three, three. I love it. <laughs> We're just going to call you 3-3 three, three boy right now. <laughs> Every game's 3-3. Three, three. Uh, Pacific, Ottawa, Wednesday at 10. Brady, got a prediction for me? Pacific, Ottawa, Wednesday at 10. Yeah, I'll, I'll go Pacific 2-0. Didn't ask for Charlie's prediction on that because I believe he's my correspondent and we don't want managers saying, well, Charlie, you called us this and this, so we don't need that. Uh, Forge <laughs> Cavalry, uh, let's all go around quickly. Game of the week, let's be honest, it hasn't been sponsored. It's not called the game of the week, but it is the game of the week in the matches this week. Uh, quick prediction from everyone. Forge Cavalry, Benedict. I'll say 2-2. Two, two. Brady? I like 2-2, two, two, actually. Yeah, I'll go 2-2. Two, two. Char Charlie? I'll say 2-1 Forge. And Marty, you get the final word. I'm going to say 2 0 Cavalry. Oh, I love wow. it. Wow. mixture up. <laughs> okay. By the way, please go to canpl.ca slash predictor for slash predictor to pick this up, those games. You can get really good points. If you think against the, uh, the majority, there's real rewards for you, and you can win a trip for the finals to the finals, two tickets to the finals later this season. Boys, that is it. Here's what we are working on this week where you can check out everything on canpl.ca. Our uh, Gatorade Team of the Week is up today on Monday. Uh, I have a fantastic interview. Please check this out with Marco Bustos as we go beyond the pitch with him and a real enlightening interview with Marco who gets real deep into a lot of things quite emotional time to talk about a few things with his time in Vancouver as well a fascinating time with Marco you will definitely think of him very differently and learn a lot about him which is the whole point of the exercise please let us know what you think about that full of previews this week as well Edmonton Halifax preview will be Brady Pacific Ottawa preview will be Charlie Canada Japan that's right the Olympics are here on Wednesday morning at 6 30 a.m eastern Benedict will be all over that for us as the women get going in Tokyo 2020. Enjoy the matches, everybody, and we'll speak to you on Friday.